so without any further ado, we are to our last debate, uh, which is kind of like bring us back to systemic therapy. And uh, we are going to have actually uh, two great speakers, uh, Dr. Juan Valle from uh, the Manchester, from the Christie's, who actually uh, has been uh, quite instrumental in defining with his team uh, the standard of care for the uh, cholangic carcinoma. And uh, Juan is uh, known in the hepatobiliary world as well as in neuroendocrine. And uh, he also serves as the vice chair for the medical advisory board for the foundation. So we work very closely as well. And uh, he's very much looking forward, as he told me, for next year's meeting because there will be a direct flight uh, from <laughs> Amsterdam to Salt Lake City. So he'll have one stop. He really went on a long tour here to get Salt Lake City. So that's one. Uh, and the other speaker is actually uh, uh, Katie Kelly from uh, UCSF, uh, again, a uh, uh, member of the NCCN as well. And uh, really, I have to say, rising star uh, trained by the best of the best. And uh, really, uh, Katie already is uh, putting her impact on the disease uh, on the, on the um, uh, national and on the global level. And, uh, you know, we, we chose him to kind of like uh, put a little bit of a, uh, a, a hot debate on one size fits all for Juan and uh, custom made therapy for Kitty and then followed by a rebuttal for Juan. So we'll see how it goes. Thanks. Thank you very much, Hassan, and uh, thanks to the organizers for uh, giving me what I think is a slightly poisoned chalice. Um, I feel like the unwanted uncle who turns up at a Christmas party and brings uh, an old CD of 1970s hits that nobody wants to hear anymore. <laughs> so now that you feel sorry for me, I'll uh, try and make the case uh, for systemic uh, therapy uh, one size fits all. So, you can see that there is a buzz about the place at the moment with everybody talking about new molecular uh, mutations. Uh, we know this, that, that we're lumping patients together who in fact have got very different biologies of disease and are likely to have actionable mutations. And we're certainly um, more broadly in, in, in oncology now in the era of, of precision medicine. So in that setting where we're trying to identify uh, ideally actionable mutations, predictive uh, biomarkers, targeted treatments that get, then give us a real big step change in patient management. Uh, how can anybody uh, argue that one size uh, fits all? So again, as previous speakers have done, let me just quickly uh, outline the, the scope of the debate. Uh, you've heard already about surgery, and in fact, uh, one size does not fit all for surgery. Uh, you've heard from Dr. Choti that it is important to assess uh, the stage of disease, the anatomical site and, and involvement uh, of local structures as well as uh, blood vessels, for example, but also patient factors like performance status and comorbidities. Similarly, when we're selecting patients for radiation-based uh, therapies, uh, again, one size does not fit all there. Uh, and again, we need to take into account uh, factors such as stage, anatomical site, again, involvement of uh, local structures, particularly thinking about any potential uh, adverse events, uh, and of course, again, uh, performance status and comorbidities. And you heard earlier from the debating team about the adjuvant treatment, uh, and I think it's fair to say that there was no consensus there. Uh, but uh, we need to take into account, again, uh, stage, and probably more mindful of uh, grade and lymph node involvement, resection margin status, uh, and also the time uh, from surgery, which we know has been important in other tumor types, and again, performance status and comorbidities. But what I want to focus on today and what uh, both of us will be doing is, is talking about systemic anti-cancer therapy. And this is now an increasingly broad term which uh, has previously only included chemotherapy, uh, but variously can include endocrine therapy, monoclonal antibodies, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and other emerging targeted therapies when we're talking about these across different types of cancers. But the reality is that in cholangiocarcinoma, we're probably talking about just chemotherapy as one option and targeted therapies which are uh, certainly uh, of interest and, and emerging. So let's go back to chemotherapy. 
This is the uh, example of the ABCO2 study, um, which we published showing the uh, doublet combination of cisplatin and gemcitabine uh, was better than gemcitabine alone. Uh, and in fact, this is in the combined analysis that we did with uh, Japanese colleagues, and I'll come back to that. And the criticism has previously been that we have lumped patients together uh, who had different types of biliary tract cancers. But that's not strictly true. With any clinical trial, there are, of course, inclusion and exclusion criteria. So by definition, you are now uh, deciding on a subpopulation rather than taking all comers. And in fact, the conclusions of the study will then apply to the population that were selected. That is, patients with locally advanced, recurrent or metastatic disease, patients with a good performance status of 0 to 1, patients with a, a bilirubin of less than one and a half times upper limit of normal, with good renal function, and this broad definition of biliary tract cancer. What does that mean? Well, within this study, biliary tract cancer, we did use as an umbrella term. It included patients with cholangiocarcinoma, which were either intrahepatic or extrahepatic, as you've heard, patients with gallbladder cancer, and we did include patients with ampullary tumors, and I know the merits of that has, has been debated by colleagues. But in fact, what that means is that we did indeed have different entities, different anatomical sites, and now we're increasingly aware of patients with molecular pathology. So although we have patients in our inclusion group, we now can see uh, that there was a, a breadth of heterogeneity in there. So did that make a difference? Well, when we looked at the uh, forest plot, and the reason I'm focusing on this particular study is because of the, the sheer power of the study in terms of the size of the patient numbers. So in a prospective randomized phase three design, as well as the BT22, which is a prospective randomized phase two study in Japanese patients, what we could see is, in fact, the magnitude of benefit was consistent regardless of where the tumors uh, actually originated from. So patients with intrahepatic, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, gallbladder cancers, all derived the same degree of benefit. Um, and patients with ampullary tumors had very wide confidence intervals, probably as a reflection of the small sample size. I think this also illustrated where collaboration and prospective planning can make a difference. So the colleagues in Japan with the BT22 study, in fact, took exactly the same protocol of the randomized design, applied the same eligibility criteria, and we had planned ahead of time uh, patient-level data uh, meta-analysis. One of the other things that we're learning is that there is a degree of heterogeneity with respect to uh, these tumors uh, with different geographical populations. And what we were able to show is that if we looked at a Japanese cohort separate to the Western population, in fact, again, the magnitude of benefit was consistent uh, regardless of geographical site. So what we can now say is that, in fact, all the subgroups in this particular study, uh, which now includes close to 500 patients um, based on anatomical site, benefited to a similar degree, uh, including patients uh, for, that were uh, outside of the Western population uh, in Japan. Now, we know, in fact, that with any systemic treatments, there are a number of factors that influence uh, effectiveness. And unfortunately, with chemotherapy, we know that not everybody's going to benefit. And in fact, only in the region of 20 to 60 percent, depending on which uh, cancer you're talking about and which treatment you're talking about, uh, that percentage of patients will receive an effective treatment. We also have to be very mindful that we are playing with fire, just like with surgery and radiotherapy. Uh, these treatments do have uh, potentially life-threatening side effects, and we know that uh, in general terms, nearly 200,000 people a year die from adverse drug reactions of any drugs. This is not just chemotherapy. So it is important that we get this risk-benefit balance right in terms of patient characteristics, uh, any genetic factors that may cause uh, an influence and, and make us change uh, how we manage these patients, any lifestyle factors, as well, of course, as any end organ function, as renal function and kidney function. We need to be mindful of uh, co-medication, and this probably applies even more so now with some of the emerging uh, targeted therapies. 
We need to make adjustment for patient's height and weight and usually uh, apply the body surface area as well as any comorbidities. And there may be a number of additional factors that in the future we'll need to learn to factor in as well. But in terms of then applying this uh, in, in a more precise manner, what we need is uh, the emergence and the use of biological insights, uh, get more and better uh, molecular diagnostic tests to allow us to have better tailored treatment and manage the disease in a, in a more efficient manner. At the moment, for chemotherapy, unfortunately, we have no biomarkers. And so patients are treated in, in an unselected manner. Uh, and in that respect, one size uh, does fit all. So I would argue that chemotherapy at the moment is one of the cornerstones of therapy. The effects are modest. You'll be aware that with combination chemotherapy in the ABCO2 and BT22 studies, uh, patients on average survived about a year. We know those effects are modest. Uh, we know, in fact, also from uh, randomized trials that have included patient populations having best supportive care only, that with best supportive care and no chemotherapy, uh, in fact, the median survival is in the region of two and a half to four and a half months. And that is uh, data that has very recently been validated by an observational study from Asia, which again shows that patients are surviving in the region of three to four months without any uh, treatment options. So we know this is an aggressive disease. We know that with chemotherapy, we can push that up to just under a year. But we do have a lack of chemotherapy options. And you could argue why that is. There are certainly many patients and many publications that have included patients having chemotherapy in the literature. One of the difficulties has always been with retrospective series, with small institutional series, small phase two studies, is that the studies have been underpowered and have not really allowed us to make a good assessment of how effective these treatments are and how they may uh, help to improve outcomes for individual patients. I think one of the things that's really changed recently is that we've moved from a generation where we uh, apologized for not having enough patients for clinical trials to an era where we're now able to deliver uh, clinical trials. So I would certainly contend that the lack of evidence of benefit in the past is not the same as the evidence of lack of benefit. And I just want to look at colorectal cancer just to, to make a point and, and, and get some reflections. Since the 1950s, uh, we've had uh, five FU, and for many decades, it had to be rejigged in a number of, of ways uh, to try and optimize the benefit that we were getting from five FU. Sometimes we thought the right thing was to do add in levamisole, and then that fell out of favor, and then we added folinic acid, and then we gave it as an infusion, uh, and, and so on. So there have been a number of modifications to try and eke the best that we could from five FU. Four close to 50 years in colorectal cancer. And then just before uh, the turn of the millennium, irunotecan came along, and then a number of other drugs followed, like oxaliplatin, bevacizumab, uh, cetuximab, and panitumumab, targeting EGFR, as well as regorafenib and aflibercept uh, most recently. But if you were living in the era between the 1950s and 2000, the mantra was then, there are no other chemotherapy options for colorectal cancer only five FU. So let's just move that on to where we are with cholangiocarcinoma. That's where we are. So if we apply that same logic, where we've only had a standard of care since 2010, and I would contend that it is still too early to rule out the emergence of other active chemotherapy agents. And in fact, uh, I'm aware that there's a number of patients here who are having uh, the uh, FUDR infusional treatment. Uh, and in fact, uh, there are other new agents that have been looked at. In fact, just for the agenda for today, you'll see there's a call for clinical trial, CAP 7.1, uh, which is in fact uh, an etoposide prodrug. Um, there are other new agents emerging. So one of the agents that we're looking at is a drug called acelerin which is a protide technology, a new version of a gemcitabine, which is not hent dependent to get it into the cell. It does not have the same toxic metabolites. Uh, and in fact, the first patient was recruited into the ABC08 uh, study, uh, which is a phase one study looking at a celerin in combination uh, with cisplatin. So I think there are still 
more questions and, put, and hopefully answers uh, with respect to more chemotherapy drugs that may come available in the future. There are studies looking at combinations of two drugs, so napaclitaxel and gemcitabine. This is a combination that we're using in pancreatic cancer. Uh, there are now triple combination chemotherapies like fulfirinox, which is being used in a modified version, uh, as well as cisplatin, gemcitabine, and 5-FU. Cisplatin, gemcitabine, and S1 in Japan to see whether triple chemotherapy can give better effects uh, than uh, doublet chemotherapy. In addition, we're looking at delivering chemotherapy in a different way. So as well as the uh, infusional pumps, uh, chemotherapy is now being looked at in beads and the addition of uh, irinotecan beads, for example, to standard cisplatin and gemcitabine chemotherapy uh, may well help us uh, to improve our outcomes. So I'd just like to make the case that chemotherapy is not dead and there are hopefully still some new uh, and, and important treatments to come uh, in the future. We already know that uh, fluoropyrimidines are active, uh, 5 few S1, UFT, capcitabine, uh, and we also know that combinations of treatment uh, are better uh, than and using monotherapy. And so if you go around to the, the triangle, you can have a gemcitabine-platinum combination in terms of a doublet, gemcitabine and a fluoropyrimidine, or a fluoropyrimidine and a platinum agent. And you'll see that the response rates, the time to progression, and the median survivals are all broadly similar, but it's always difficult to interpret these because the confidence intervals are quite wide given the heterogeneous, heterogeneous nature of the studies. So then the question is, does one size fit any? Um, and we have learned from some negative studies with uh, targeted therapies that, in fact, it can be very difficult uh, to pick up a signal from, uh, from targeted therapies, and in this case, uh, EGFR inhibition. We need to be very cautious about having an exciting, positive single arm phase two study at the beginning, because that's what all of this work was, uh, was built on. There was a phase two study that showed very promising response rates by adding um, uh, cetuximab to uh, the Gemox combination. And in fact, the results were so good uh, that it was pretty much a no-brainer that this was then going to be the next new standard of care provided it could be uh, confirmed in a randomized prospective study. Unfortunately, that did not happen. And in fact, we are now four negative randomized studies in to the story of EGFR. Two of those have used uh, cetuximab, one of them used erlotinib, and the most recent one has used panitumumab. And there were always the questions about, is it about patient selection? So we, they were looking at EGFR overexpression, there was no correlation. Looking at KRAS mutational status, there was no correlation. And in fact, in the last study, the panitumumab study, patients were specifically selected who were KRAS wild type, and in fact, in that group where you probably were going to get the most likelihood of, of benefit, in fact, the study uh, was negative. But what we don't know is within those numbers, were there occasional patients who did benefit, and how do we tease that out? So it may be that our tools at the moment are a little too blunt, and we need to try and understand a bit better which patients, if any, benefited. But what did the EGFR story tell us? With those four negative studies, I think we have learned some lessons. We can't transfer the lessons from one tumor type, in this case colorectal cancer, to biliary tract cancer. We have to learn the lessons over again. And that applies with respect to EGFR overexpression or KRAS uh, mutational status. We do have low statistical power in biliary tract cancer, that's for sure, and that's a reflection of the, the, the sample size. We know from colorectal cancer that in fact chemotherapy partner may matter. Irinotecan may be preferable to oxaliplatin, 5-FU may be preferable to capecitabine. So what does that mean when we're looking at this in the field of biliary tract cancer? But I think it's fair to say that EGFR inhibition is still need to be considered investigational in biliary tract cancer. And I think there is some scope for some further uh, study, maybe a pooled analysis or a detailed evaluation of some patients who may have shown an exceptional response uh, to give us a little bit more information there. 
And of course, we're now in an era, and you've seen this data in a number of different forms today, uh, of uh, understanding the genetic environment and molecular phenotyping uh, patients. Certain themes are already coming through. So intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, we know, has a different profile to extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma or gallbladder cancer, and particularly with uh, FGFR fusion rearrangements and, and IDH1 and 2, which you've heard uh, tend to appear exclusively in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas and give us a potential for treatment in that arena. You've also heard earlier that, in fact, the uh, molecular signature from the opistochus, the liver fluke-associated uh, cholangiocarcinoma, is different to that which is non-liver fluke-associated. And you also heard that uh, the inflammatory subclass, uh, which is different to proliferative, proliferative subclass, may allow us to define, divide patients into possibly up to six smaller subgroups. But what we also need to understand is that at the same time of understanding whether these are predictive biomarkers to allow us to select treatment, we have to also understand what is their prognostic implication. And you've heard that potentially with FGFR, uh, that does confer different patients do have a different prognosis uh, to those who don't have FGR fusion rearrangements. And I think the, one of the challenges ahead is going to be how to put uh, these mutational findings into context. And if you look at the primary tumor with the first uh, rosetta at the, uh, at the top, uh, you've got a founder cells in the middle, uh, three different subclones uh, that are uh, around it. But in fact, you then have a metastasis. Uh, these may be founder cells from the subclone one, as well as additional subclones. And you can see a different metastasis might look quite different uh, to the primary tumor. So we need to understand much better, is it the primary we're looking at? Is it metastasis we're looking at? What are the changes over time? What are the implications of those changes on our, on our therapy? So coming back to the debate, uh, I would contend that along with surgery and radiotherapy, chemotherapy remains one of the pillars of treatment for biliary tract cancer. And as you heard from Jennifer Knox earlier on today, we cannot throw out the, the incremental gains that we're making with biliary tract cancer because there's a horizon that looks exciting in the future. And I think until we understand more about actionable mutations, validated predictive biomarkers, and how these inform therapy selection, for now, one size does fit all. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers and Stacy in particular for inviting me this year, and of course, Ghassan, who um, was very generous in his introduction. And um, of course, Juan is always a tough act to follow. Um, I'll have to concede at the very get go that I committed a debate faux pas by hedging a little, even in my title, by saying, adding the title, adding the words moving towards custom made therapy um, from the original title of custom made, since I do agree that this is a work in progress and, as Maeve alluded to earlier, very aspirational. But hopefully, with a lot of the work going on today and the work, most importantly, in the laboratory and, and reaching now the clinic, this is not only aspirational but a pinnacle. Um, a, a precipice, rather, of, of where we are. Let's see. So here's the outline of how I wanted to approach this uh, for custom-made therapy in cholangiocarcinoma. We've certainly discussed the why quite a bit throughout the day already. Um, the whether is a yes, with the, again, my, my hedge and disclaimer, um, the asterisk, starting with clinical research, of course. Um, and the challenge, of course, will be how to implement this, who, when, and how. So why to customize? Just to recap some of the themes of the day so far, um, we all know that biliary tract cancers represent a cancer of enormous anatomic as well as biologic heterogeneity. And the slide I show here is a, a picture of how the anatomy interfaces with the stem cell niches and potential cells of origin of the cancers we're treating. And it turns out that these uh, cells of origin may have a great impact on the downstream genetics, epigenetics, and potentially even the interaction with the tumor microenvironment for the cancers that eventually arise from these locations and have dramatic impact on prognosis and response to treatment, hence the why to customize therapy. And tomorrow I look forward greatly to hearing more about the, our evolving understanding of this very complex interplay between genetics, epigenetics, as well as the microenvironment. 
So this is a slide we've also seen a couple times already today, looking at the tumor genomic alterations as they subdivide in different anatomic locations within biliary tract cancers. Let's see if I have a pointer here. Um, So I've circled here the genomic aberrations that are statistically different between sites of origin, and as you'll see, we see um, ERB2 or HER2, which is the sort of the foundation of personalized medicine in cancer when it became discovered in breast cancer as a viable therapeutic target, is significantly higher in gallbladder cancers than extrahepatic and intrahepatic, while KRAS, unfortunately not targetable, is significantly more uh, common in extrahepatics than intra or gallbladder. And then moving down to the topics of the day, um, FDFR gene fusions and amplifications, significantly more common in intrahepatic, and IDH1 and 2 mu activating mutations, also significantly more common in intrahepatic. This is data based on a presentation from Millen's group in collaboration with Foundation Medicine, who looked at approximately 200 genes using hybridization capture, of course, to identify these genomic aberrations. Even within a single anatomic location, however, of intrahepatic glandiocarcinoma, we also see recurring th themes across studies and across different populations showing that there are emerging uh, subsets, both by tr uh, transcriptome or gene expression signatures, as well as by sequencing and, next gen and mutation status between uh, just the intrahepatic anatomic location with um, different, with subsets showing um, FGFR fusions, which are almost mutually exclusive with IDH1 mutation, and potentially some relationship to the transcriptome, as shown by the proliferation subclass from RNA-seq um, performed by the, uh, the Mount Sinai group. So the key question as we recognize these differences in molecular features across anatomic subsets, not only how do they impact on therapy, which is what I'm coming to next, but what is their impact on prognosis, which is a critical point of understanding for us as we work with this extremely rare cancer requiring us to compare by necessity between uh, cross studies. And so we really have very little data about this right now, which is a huge limitation and, and one of the key priorities, I think, as we move forward. Um, also from MD Anderson and Millen's group, um, this data here shows potential as expected and is seen in other cancers, so no surprise, potential worse outcome in, in a subset of patients that have P53 mutations as well as KRAS and mutations of MAP kinase and mTOR pathways, and again, something that's recapitulated or similar from some other cancer types. But also, from the FGFR2 pathway, there may be a pro positive prognostic impact, and that's very hard to interpret from very small numbers with uh, just a sample size of about 55, particularly when we think about the, the enormity of the confounding factors that are uh, attendant to a study like this, where we have ascertainment bias, which patients get sequenced, the selection bias of patients making it to a tertiary center for a clinical trial. So it's very hard to know what to make of these numbers in a, in a small study. Um, but they're nonetheless very important. I'm going to try to backtrack for one slide here. There we go. I also wanted to highlight also that Andrew Zhu and, and uh, Lipika Goyal's group have looked at a, a 100 patients with a, about 30 percent of whom had IDH1 and 2 mutations and didn't show in a separate study any particular prognostic value, but again, uh, relatively small numbers to date. But this is uh, really the extent of the data we have right now, and it's, it's very hard to interpret the outcomes of populations by biomarker selection without knowing this with greater detail in larger samples. So to summarize the why, why, why do we talk about custom-made therapy? We, we agree that there are recurring high-frequency somatic mutations and other molecular aberrations occurring within cholangiocarcinoma. Some of these aberrations may be prognostic, but again, that's uh, an area we need a lot more uh, research. And some of the high-frequency cholangiocarcinoma mutations and aberrations are thought to be drivers amenable to targeted therapeutics. So the question then, or this prompts our hypothesis and our, our aspiration of developing treatments and trials according to biologically defined subpopulations in order that we may improve upon our current outcomes. So then the whether, whether we should customize, there's certainly a strong rationale, unmet need. Um, we know that the one-size-fits-all treatment is really not adequate or we're not happy with the outcomes, particularly after first-line therapy. We need much, many more active treatments. 
Um, and treatment targeting biologically defined subpopulations, including the FGFR2 fusion population, the IDH1 mutation population, and potentially the PDL1 positive or MSI high populations, which again I'll um, go further into detail in the next section, suggests that we may have potential for improved outcomes. And this is based on emerging data, both from the laboratory and preclinical models, as well as small, very small clinical trials. But again, a hedge, which again, I apologize for the debate faux pas, customizing therapy really needs to start with biomarker selected clinical and translational research to validate these targets and pathways, establish their efficacy according to each context, and discern the critical question of predictive from pro prognostic. I think it's worthwhile to step back for a moment and review chemotherapy for biliary tract cancer where we stand in 2016, which uh, of course Juan has done very eloquently before me. Um, but as, as Juan pointed out, before 2010 there really was no established first line therapy owing to the many challenges of this population. Um, in 2010 we saw the ABCO2 trial established and GEMSYS is our new first line regimen and the first regimen to improve survival in a randomized trial. But as of today, there remains no standard second-line therapy that has proven uh, it with level one evidence to be efficacious. Um, I think it's, uh, there's a, a very interesting recent publication from a group in France published by Brew et al. Um, in cancer this year that looked at about 600 patients across regimens in a multicenter trial and measured their median progression-free survival on various second-line regimens after a first-line gem platinum. And they reported across those 600 patients a median PFS in, in second line of three months, a response rate of about 12 percent, and only about 30 percent of patients actually made it to second line. And they show subset analyses that single agent fluoropyrimidine was equivalent to doublet agents and that there was no superior regimen when looking across the regimens that were used, which included fluoropyrimidines, taxane, and renatecan based regimens. So all in all, a rather dismal landscape of efficacy when we look at an unselected population treated with our standard agents. And as of today, looking at the NCCN guidelines, we see clinical trial as the second line regimen falling right below gem cytobine combination with, cis with cisplatin. And there is no FDA labeled agent for second line use in biliary tract cancers. So, moving towards custom made therapy, some examples of positive signals in biomarker selected clinical trials that I think are worth discussing as, as aspirational and also very hopeful examples of places if, that we might be able to make a difference. So, first, looking at the IDH1 and IDH2 mutations, which are pre present together in about 20% uh, of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. There are trials ongoing now of uh, several agents, including the, the most developed or far along AG120, uh, which targets IDH1, um, as well as a dual agent AG81, which is in phase one trials, and an IDH2 specific inhibitor 221. We also, I'll also talk about the FGFR2 um, inhibition using BGJ398, a phase two trial that was presented earlier today as well. And of course, immunotherapy, potentially for a biomarker select subpopulation whether defined by PD-1 or MSI remains to be seen. So the selected examples of targets have relatively high frequencies in advanced biliary cancers, uh, predominantly so far in intrahepatic. These are detectable now uh, with commercially available CLIA new technologies, including our ability to detect fusion proteins by next generation sequencing. These are targetable in some cases by novel mechanisms such as uh, cell differentiation in the case of IDH1 or 2 inhibition and immunotherapy. And finally, they show promising efficacy in the second line space where there is no established therapy in a very bleak playing field. So looking first at the FGF2, uh, FGFR2 fusion inhibition, um, the incidence of FGFR2 fusions is approximately 20% in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, depending on uh, the study and depending on the methodology used. The BGJ398 drug is an ATP con competitive inhibitor targeting predominantly FGFR1 through 3, which is uh, nearing completion of a phase 2 trial for cholangiocarcinoma patients harboring FGFR2 fusions or other selected aberrations. And the data on this uh, trial were just presented a few weeks ago at ASCO GI with the primary endpoint of overall response, and these patients were all required to have failed standard first-line therapy. So this is the waterfall plot showing an impressive response rate in this population of about 24 percent. Um, it, it should be emphasized that this is a difficult population. They um, had greater than or equal to two prior lines of therapy in over uh, 60 percent of patients. 
um, and the um, let's see um, median uh, duration of treatment or um, reported is approximately 188 days. Now I draw here a PFS2 benchmark from the Brew et al. French data, which is about three months um, using, using their benchmark, just to show again that this median duration is about twice as long. Um, a, a certainly an encouraging signal, but again must be taken with the very significant attention to the context of not knowing exactly the prognostic impact of FGFR2. Certainly seeing responses correlating with prolonged progression-free survival is encouraging, but in a single arm study with uh, local adjudication of response, this, we, we must be reminded of the example Juan drew to cetuximab and follow this with a randomized study. But nonetheless, from the custom-made uh, therapy debate seat. This is very encouraging and certainly warrants enthusiasm and further research. So looking next at IDH1 and 2 inhibitors for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, these also combined have an incidence of approximately 20%. Um, and there are multi-center phase one trials uh, in cholangiocarcinoma cohorts ongoing, um, including the AG120 IDH1 inhibitor from Agios, as I mentioned earlier. Their preliminary results were presented at the triple meeting of the NCI, URTC, and um, ACR in November, and also showed impressive uh, time to, on treatment um, uh, swim plots, um, though I don't believe that they had reached uh, a median PFS at the time of reporting. Here again is the line for our median progression-free survival benchmark with standard uh, cytotoxic therapy. Um, and at the time of reporting, um, most of these patients were still on treatment. They also showed impressive uh, biologic activity in pre and post biopsy in at least uh, two or three cases um, and had good promising tolerability. Again, a provocative finding in a biomarker selective trial with supported by very extensive preclinical data. Jim and others have talked about the pembrolizumab story in cholangiocarcinoma and other immunotherapy options. Um, here we see the example of Keynote 28, which is the first biliary cohort in an immunotherapy trial to my knowledge. And this, again, you've seen earlier today, but I'll add a couple extra details. Um, I think it's important to note that this study screened 87 patients to enroll, um, to enroll 24 with a 41% biomarker positivity rate for the required integral biomarker of pdl one expression by IHC for this particular study, bearing in mind that most of the other biomarker subsets that we're talking about have an incidence that's much lower than that and will require screening much higher numbers of patients to enroll. Um, in that 24 patients that they treated, the majority were cholangio, the four were gallbladder, and several of the responses were in gallbladder. They had a partial response rate of 17%, um, and very low toxicity rate. And the provocative finding, again, of this study is these, the subset of patients with super response measured both by uh, radiographic response via RESIST as well as their robust duration. There's other signal of PD, PD-1 or checkpoint inhibition in the mismatch repair biomarker cohort of uh, cholangiocarcinoma, also shown by Jim, where here we see the in the um, the presentation from um, Dung Lee et al. just a couple weeks ago at GI ASCO, in the non-colorectal mismatch repair deficient GI cancer um, basket or bucket trial rather, uh, three patients with cholangiocarcinoma enrolled, and at least one had a complete response and prolonged time on treatment, which remains ongoing, suggesting com complementing other uh, other tumor types that MSI status or mismatch repair deficiency may be a promising biomarker for a response in this in this. Uh, in this tumor type as well for checkpoint inhibition response. But um, as you can see from the two studies I've shown, the non-colorectal MSI high study and the previous Keynote 28 study, we really don't know what will be the biomarker for uh, immunotherapy for, for, uh, for cholangiocarcinoma or other cancers for that matter. PDL1 in immunohistochemistry may enrich for responsiveness, but there are certainly plenty of data, particularly in bladder, uh, lung, melanoma for that matter, that show responsiveness is possible and, and durable, robust responses are, are common in patients without PDL1 expression by immunohistochemistry on their tumors. MSI high status certainly is panning out as a biomarker to date, looking across tumor types from the non colorectals and, um, and colorectal cancer. Um, but MSI 
or sorry, microcellulite stable or proficient MMR cases have also shown response. So they, it is not a marker for non-response. It may just enrich for likelihood of response. Um, the Keynote 158 trial, the follow-up Merck basket trial that's just opening right now, which includes, again, a biliary tract cohort, thankfully, will be um, enrolling all comers, any biliary tract cancer, independent of any biomarker, but looking retroactively at uh, fresh tumor at the start of therapy to try to really nail down, is there a biomarker and what is it, including pdl one status, MSI high, and a, what I believe is a proprietary gene expression signature of sorts, which perhaps looks at cytolytic pattern, I don't know. Um, but that will be a very informative study to let us know um, the, the key question here of whether immunotherapy will actually prove to be a custom-made therapy after all versus a one-size-fits-all approach. We don't know that yet. So moving forward, of course, the devil is in the details, who, when, and how. Um, who should be considered for custom-made therapy at this point? Should we consider all biliary tract cancer patients or just intrahepatic, bearing in mind the high proportions of HER2 and gallbladder and that we'll miss some potentially targeted, uh, targetable patients with BRAF or microcyte instability that, that occur across uh, anatomic sites? And when should we think about customizing our therapy? Adjuvant, neoadjuvant I didn't include there, first line, second line, et cetera. Um, and if we do that, how do we sequence or combine standard therapies with targeted therapy and target positive po patients? And is it possible that sequence may matter more for some drugs than others, such as the IDH1 inhibitors? And of, of course, the challenge has always been how to design and imp implement enrichment trials in rare cancers, bearing in mind that our rare subsets in biliary tract cancers are orders of magnitude fewer patients than ALK patients in non-small lung cancer, which dwarf the number of cholangiocarcinoma patients that we see per year in the United States, just in that rare subset alone. Um, so the, the biomarker designs that work for lung cancer really can't be applied to biliary tract cancers. So the, the ensuing question that we face day to day also is how to test for and validate these targets, particularly when many of our sub subjects only have scant cytology or limited tumor testing for, spec for, for t um, biomarker analysis, and we often get quantity not sufficient reports back from the lab. So what kind of testing? Do we need to do sequencing, um, gene expression, epigenetics? What is the level of our taxonomy um, for biomarkers to date? And this begs the question, and again, we'll look forward to hearing more about this tomorrow, um, better understanding and defining our molecular taxonomy to generate custom-made therapy subsets so here is a sort of a, a very simplistic approach that we apply right now at UCSF, um, and I suspect is probably quite similar across many of your, your practices and hospitals. Um, we do try to take a customized approach to all of our biliary tract cancer patients who are potentially eligible for a clinical trial. What do I mean by that? Um, we sequence tumors before or during first-line therapy in patients who might potentially be trial eligible, so healthy patients who wish to take an aggressive approach to their cancer and don't have prohibitive comorbidities. And we do consider this, or speaking for myself at least, as a standard of care at this point, bearing in mind the absence of second-line therapy options labeled by the FDA, the inclusion of clinical trials as a, an appropriate second-line step by the NCCN guidelines, and the fact that we will not make progress in this cancer without understanding better what these molecular subsets mean. So I think that's probably the most controversial thing I have on any of these slides is the standard of care sequencing, at least my opinion on that. Um, we refer patients for greater than or equal to second-line therapy trials if they have a trial-eligible mutation or if there is another trial that makes sense for them, um, bearing in mind sort of our, our glum outlook on what's the likelihood of efficacy of standard agents in second line. And we await right now where it'll be interesting to see which of these targeted agents move into first line for competition and which will require us to really rethink this and deal with the, the true question at hand of when to customize if we have a first line agent available. Um, the how, um, we send our tumors for sequencing by an NGS panel, either an institutional panel called the UCSF 500 or more commonly Foundation One if there's adequate tumor, and are very interested in uh, validating circulating tumor cell-free DNA when tumor is, is inadequate. Um, and we've been using Garden Health, though there are many other commercially available platforms coming down the pike, including Foundation. 
We also strive to track our patients' outcomes in a longitudinal collaborative registry that uh, we developed as part of a tissue bank thanks to support from the Billy Project Foundation and the Calandrocarcinoma Foundation. And we've been very pleased to be able to collaborate with um, Millen's group and OSU um, as well as others so far in sharing our data. Um, because again, it's critical that we have other uh, alternate ways to define the prognosis of these mo molecular subsets given their rarity. We refer patients to an advanced biliary tract cancer specific trial if possible, if they have an, an eligible mutation. More often, we end up referring them to a pan-cancer molecular basket trial or just a, uh, such as signature match or a PD-1 agent if the target is present without an ABC trial available or advanced biliary trial available. And then this, the sticky wicket and the difficult final bullet point of carefully considering the use of off-label therapies, uh, for example, for the HER2 positive gallbladder patient when we exhaust standard therapy options. And that is, of course, something that also requires data but may not have a trial available. So another uh, slide on the when. The, I, I do think that the proving ground right now is in the greater than, uh, the second or greater line therapy space, simply because there is no standard therapy. Uh, First-line trials um, testing biomarkers for eligibility are, are significantly limited by the testing turnaround time. By the time we get a patient, their block and the results back, it's often three weeks or more from the time that we would have liked to start therapy, which would require a delay in starting the therapy that we know is most proven to affect a benefit and change the course of their disease based on the data we have today. Um, many patients also, because of this, the rarity of this cancer, will start their, their treatment in the community before they even get referred to us, making it very infeasible to do first-line custom-made therapy. These rare niches are very hard to find. We need to screen at least 10 to 1 patients to identify marker-positive subsets, allowing, again, a little more time to do that if we treat in the second line for at least our first signal-finding studies. We definitely need to expand access to trials. Um, and, you know, down the road, we certainly hope that success in the second line will indicate moving to first line for particular agents where it may make sense or proceeding with combinations depending on the mechanism and the agent. And again, this must be customized itself depending on what drug we're talking about and how it may work. Um, I think this is all critical upon finding a path to F accelerated FDA approvals for the high frequency subsets, such as the FD GFR2 data. And. Um, I, I included, as I think my last slide, a, a, a concept for a pragmatic second-line biomarker basket trial for ABC, bearing in mind that one of our fundamental problems is lack of access to trials and lack of availability of these drugs. It's well and, all well and good for us at a tertiary academic center to talk about the biomarker trials we have for cholangiocarcinoma, but in reality, these aren't available to many patients. And I think we, we in, in an ideal world, would like to harness mechanisms such as the NCTN, other consortia or potentially independently designed, independently run, but similarly designed phase two parallel trials to try to make as much as we can non-comparative designs comparative, at least um, for signal finding and to guide our hypotheses. Um, and of course, I, I inserted this word pragmatic at the end because this is far from perfect, but it's uh, the idea of trying to, to to harness the, the, and give more access to patients while, while testing hypotheses in a rare population. So to conclude, um, there is, of course, strong preclinical and cl clinical rationale and a very um, urgent unmet medical need for custom-made therapy in cholangiocarcinoma. Promising outcomes in the current clinical trial support sequencing of tumors um, of trial-eligible advanced biliary cancer patients to guide our second or later line therapy decisions. Um, the rarity of the individual molecular subsets we're talking about requires very thoughtful trial design, including potentially the idea of a multi-targeted ABC basket trial for second-line therapy, or multi-disease target pathway-specific basket trials, such as BRAF trials for any and all cancer types, and mining molecular registry data to really discern the prognostic impact in each context so we can understand what the results mean. Um, Combination sequencing, introduction into first line or neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting will be mechanism and agent specific, and I certainly am looking forward to hearing more about this in years to come when we have these agents um, in, in play. Um, but to get there, we need increased access to more clinical trials and accelerated FDA approval mechanisms. Um, and finally, in, in uh, 
preface to tomorrow's talks, I think that ultimately making progress in custom-made therapy requires close integration and iteration with our laboratory and translational colleagues to de really define the targets and our pathways involved and try to identify the clusters of patients, not just by a single mutation, by um, all the, the tools available to match them to the most active agent available. That's it. Thank you. I think I got a very brief rebuttal. <laughs> um, isn't it exciting? Um, we're certainly looking to have uh, new tools, and Katie mentioned the word, word tools, and uh, it's great as a community to get a sense of new tools that we may be able to use in addition to our established tools like surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy. I don't think this is about displacing tools. This is about learning how to use them all to the best of our abilities. And just to use one of the examples, the, the HER2 in gallbladder cancer, if that were to subsequently prove to be a, a way forward, we know this has happened in gastric cancer, we know it's happened in breast cancer. That doesn't mean we've thrown out the other treatments. We still use chemotherapy for those two cancers. So it's about understanding how best we can use these in, in combination. I think uh, Anthony Alquiri previously just uh, talked about having that broader understanding about what's going on in the microenvironment, what's going on in the immune environment, what's the impact of epigenetics. And I absolutely agree with Katie that what we need to be doing is to be working with our basic science and translational colleagues to be able to understand uh, how these uh, all interweave with each other. So it may be that rather than one size fits all, it should be one approach fits all. And that approach should be our commitment as a community to apply all the tools to the best of our abilities with what we know now, but also to apply all the enthusiasm that Katie mentioned uh, to look at expanding and developing new tools and learning how to apply them. Thank you very much. So I uh, just, it's uh, very instructive to, I thought the EJFR story and RAS is very instructive and just a side note, as we hold up what we think we know w to remind us that we really don't know. And that is uh, the finding that we'll present at ASCO this coming up that in colon cancer, right-sided colon cancer is different than left-sided colon cancer vis-a-vis -vis RAS, the importance of RAS. So, so it is not, it, nothing is simple at all, even what we think we already know. Mm -hmm. So we shouldn't be the least bit surprised that this is tough sledding, because this is a much more complex problem. I guess one of the questions I had for you, Juan, is have you seen any difference in outcome in your studies in patients who've been stented versus those who have not been stented? Because I struggle to understand if the, if the microbacterial environment may not be very important in, in this setting, and if that might be a confounder that, have you stratified for that, for example? So one of, one, of, one of the things that we looked at uh, in the forest plot, a subgroup analysis from the ABCO2 as well as the BD22 studies was prior therapy. Now prior therapy didn't mean prior chemotherapy because it was a first line study, but did, it did take into account uh, what in most patients was prior stenting. Again, the magnitude of benefit appeared to be the same in those who had prior therapy to those who hadn't. I guess the, the only comment I would make is that there's probably a time delay on these things. By the time um, we've instrumented the, the biliary system, and of course you've then got much more uh, infection, inflammation all set up, uh, that's probably much shorter in, in the timeline uh, within which these tumors have, uh, have, have developed. So, uh, so far we haven't seen a difference. Thank you both, uh, great talks. I just want to bring up intra-arterial therapies, both with chemotherapy and non-chemotherapy. Um, obviously at Memorial, we're, we're a bit chemotherapy, uh, hepatic artery infusion pump chemotherapy heavy on the patients that are liver only who get pump chemotherapy and systemic chemo. And, and the data from our well-selected trials are, are, are with longer survivals than when we compare them to other groups. And so that's led a lot of people to look at intra-arterial therapies, and I think Dr. Chapman is a good example of, of demonstrating that it doesn't have to be done at Memorial. You can successfully do this outside of Memorial. But what about Y90? Um, because now I see almost every patient that gets referred to me for an opinion has either had it already or has had been told that's what they should have. 
So who should be getting these? Because I think especially with Y90, it's really being offered to many patients, sometimes what I think is appropriately, sometimes inappropriately, and it seems like there's really very little guidance on who should be getting offered this and how it should be combined with chemotherapy. Do you guys know in England what's Y90? Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we just take that? Oh, go ahead. Uh, so, so, um, so Y90, just for those of you who are not familiar, these are uh, radioactive beads uh, which are labeled with yttrium-90 and are given through an uh, intrahepatic arterial route, and effectively the beads are then uh, stuck in the vascular system, which delivers high doses of radiation uh, to the tumors in the liver. So these are patients pr primarily with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and there have been a number of, seri of, of series now that have been uh, published, and there was a recent systematic review that pooled all of the data. Uh, interestingly, not all the studies had the same endpoints, so not all of them had a response rate, not all of them had overall survival. But what they were able to show is that response rate was in the region of around high 20s percent. Um, and there was also um, a, a median overall survival of the pool data of, of close to two years. Now, what does that mean in the context of standalone studies? Uh, remember that you may also have a stage shift. So you may have patients who have not got metastatic disease and therefore would naturally have a slightly longer survival than would be expected anyway. So you're probably tired of hearing my record, but it all come down to a randomized study to tell us what the incremental benefit is over and above our standard of care. And in fact, the Circus study that's about to roll out um, is a study wherein patients have been randomized to have a cisplatin gemcitabine chemotherapy as a standard of care in one arm, or uh, the Y90 followed by cisplatin gemcitabine chemotherapy. So the Y90 is being used uh, up front uh, prior to systemic chemotherapy. And that study will really allow us to understand that incremental step that we're achieving. And I think just to add to that, the, the the answer also is very similar for questions surrounding radiation and um, in the setting of locally advanced but non-metastatic disease, such as Ted brought up with the NRG GI001 study, which looks at chemo plus uh, radiation versus chemo alone for this population and is a, a critical randomized study to answer the question of the role of the local intervention in a population that has extremely high rates of distant metastatic spread at, at progression, um, as Jennifer showed with her recent 2015 data, looking, I think 80 some percent of patients presented with either local plus distant or distant metastatic disease um, after, after resection. So even if this is a poorer population than that. So um, I think both of you um, presented your, your arguments very nicely. I think, um, Katie, we've had lots of discussions that we really feel like the second line setting is this wide open space, and really our passion <laughs> is trying to develop uh, clinical trials to move uh, the field forward. And so I, I was interested in your slide you put up as for your potential clinical trial proposal. Um, we've been discussing a very similar proposal on the ECOG group. Um, but I, I wanted to raise one question, and especially with a lot of clinical trial thought leaders in the room, is do we need the CATE? So Maeve is about to present the data that the Colangio Carcinoma Foundation funded, and you alluded to that the outcomes are very dismal. And so can you use, for acceleration of demonstration of efficacy, can you use historical controls when the data is so bleak? The bar is pretty low. I think um, that trial design is definitely a, a, a work in progress and a pragmatic approach to a very difficult, uh, largely unsolvable problem. Um, I included a, an other arm for patients who don't have a targetable aberration so that there is a treatment arm that would serve as a contemporary control, but it doesn't really answer the prognostic question of, well, you know, the FDFR2 fusions go up in a targeted bucket and they probably have a very different prognosis than the, the non-FGFR2s who go in the standard therapy bucket. But um, I think depending on what agents one has to work with, that, that arm could change to something else. And so the idea being to have a, a, a really the, the infrastructure for taking second line patients or patients trial eligible and doing one set of testing and pre-screening and allowing that same, that point of care to funnel them into five different trials instead of doing the 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 screening and telling the 19 patients, sorry, at least you have several other options and can capture a, a much higher proportion of this really difficult space that needs other access. And so it's really more of an infrastructure rather than the specific agents um, that I'm wishing we could wrap our hands around. The, the, the 
intellectual property issues are huge. To run multiple uh, IP agents at once is you know, almost insurmountable, but that would be sort of the way I would approach this with, without that barrier in place. And maybe without CAPE, depending if we had a, a better agent to try. So maybe I, I just add one, one thing there. Uh, if once we um, published on the ABC02, uh, we, there was a follow-up publication that looked at defining the population for a first-line study. Uh, and what that al allowed us to do is to, across different centers, to align the eligibility criteria for patients going into first-line studies. There's always the caveat of cross-trial comparisons, but I think we might be missing a trick as a community. Um, because I think if we were to move towards standardizing eligibility criteria for second-line studies, of course, there has to be some that are uh, agent-specific and, 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 and may then make some changes. But if we have standard criteria for performance status, renal function, hepatic function, and so on, then we will get a much better sense of uh, the, mag the magnitude of, of these changes across the different studies, even with all the caveats of cross-trial comparison. So my first question is, is to Juan. The, the, the ABC02 trial, I just looked it up again. Um, you had 57 patients with perihilar cholangiocarcinoma, carcinoma, clearly crossed one, the confidence intervals, big time. So, so, so is this really a standard of practice for perihilar cholangiocarcinoma? carcinoma? I, I guess I've argued in the written literature that it's not. So, uh, so the, the study was powered for whole group analysis. <laughs> So we have to be careful with the subgroup analysis. They really are just to, um, they are exploratory, exactly that. Uh, and of course, the, the, the confidence intervals will largely depend on the sample size. Uh, so I, I think it, um, in an ideal world, you would do a study just looking at population in a randomized design. Uh, but I think we're a long way away from that just because of the uh, availability of number of patients. I, I, I that's, I would still argue that they would, the numbers were sufficient for the other subgroups, yeah. and, and I think it's a different disease. I agree it's a different disease, um, but, but I think we, we have what we have in terms of that subgroup, uh, and I think if we can find something that is performing much better than that, then of course that becomes a standard of care. Do they um, do they get do they get uh, their their tumor sequenced? Do they look for a trial? Do they go to GemSys or GemOx uh, first? Um, and, and this is an area that's really difficult to counsel people. Really difficult to, to uh, help them make decisions. And I was wondering if you two could come to a consensus on that to help the patient. <laughs> I think that was where we didn't. Tr I. <laughs> don't really debate that I, I use GEMSYS first right now. We don't have agents that have yet graduated to first-line trials. Um, we may in the future, and we'll have to decide in, at that point which whether to put a patient on a trial, which in general we would want to get the data and learn from it, so yes. But right now I, I use GEMSYS absolutely as a first-line regimen. And then um, in trial-eligible patients, try to have sequencing in time for the moment of progression to guide the decision-making in a completely unknown uh, place where, you know, using a taxane or using even fulfury is really the same level of evidence as going to a tr is, is not level one evidence to begin with. So I think it's probably a pretty similar answer, I would assume, at most places. I, I think you're right. I think it's about having an honest conversation ab about the fact that, you know, the, the available treatments we have in second line at the moment uh, are very modest. Uh, and I think the default setting would be to encourage patients to participate in a clinical trial. I would agree, and I was thinking of that when I came up. Uh, I enjoyed both your presentations. I, Katie, I like your, um, your big approach to getting, getting these, these programs uh, organized. I think as, as time goes on, I think the population that's eligible for second-line trials is, is, is greater than what the data you had. And, and I think it can, it, you know, things have changed a lot in the last couple years. You know where where we would think about second and third lines where we wouldn't have previously, and we accrue so rapidly to our our phase two second lines that I think the numbers would be better. So I think the approach of trying to get people queued up while they're on first line for second it's it's brilliant. It's what we all want to do. So I I just wanted to say again, we got to figure out a way to work together so that we can all have a little program 
of trials eligible and I know your patient can't come to me and vice versa but we need to support each other in, in these so it's maybe one of the things we could talk about yeah great presentations so I'm projecting forward Millen's wonderful trial leads to the approval of BGJ at the end of the year and you guys are asked to design an adjuvant trial or you get a call from someone in the back of the room that says my tumor was resected and there's no adjuvant therapy for me right now because there's no data or because you know I already got gemcis or I got gemcitabine a while ago but can I have it now if my tumor has this mutation what would you do I th I think that that would be really conscribing them really to indefinite therapy if we have unmeasurable disease uh, for a drug that we don't know if it's safe to start and stop. And um, I think I would say, you know, we have some adjuvant data for standard cytotoxics and some understanding of, uh, you know, admittedly, you know, Dr. Gore's point's taken um, that we, we, that's an area of debate in and of itself. Um, I think taking, if BGJ is successful, which I very much hope it will be, and I'm encouraged by the data, I think it will certainly need randomized data to confirm its activity, um, perhaps post-approval or an accelerated model. Um, and then I would not use it in the adjuvant setting at this time without a lot more evidence and data. I think just to, to add to that comment, uh, I think we're still in an era where we're trying to understand what happens on progression. So we're certainly blocking pathways, but black pathways, there, there is the redundancy, there's crosstalk, there is emergence of resistance, and we don't know what's going to happen then downstream. So I think until we have a better understanding of, of that uh, evolution, we need to be a little bit cautious going into the adjuvant setting. I think you might have just uh, answered my question. Um, so a lot of the data we're seeing in the lab based on the genetics isn't necessarily matched when you look downstream from the DNA. So that when you look at what's happening in the cell signaling pathways or in the RNA transcription, you're not getting the same data as you are with the mutations. So just because a, a, a tumor has a mutation doesn't mean that that mutation is actually going to do anything to the cell. So A, the, the gene may be repressed so you're not seeing overexpression. B, if you do get uh, activation of, the, of a, of a receptor tyrosine kinase, that may be completely counteracted by some other mutations going on in that cell or some other response to that cell. And the cells that are driving the tumor aren't necessarily the ones that have got that mutation. They may be driving it as long as you're not treating it, but as soon as you start treating it, and the, the classic example is the BRAF inhibitors when you start getting other tumors coming up. So I think it's maybe a little too early to say that actually the targeted therapies didn't work because maybe they are, we just don't know in which tumors they are working in, and maybe we're giving them to the wrong patients. We shouldn't be necessarily be giving them to the ones with the mutations, we need to be giving them to the ones who have got the activated pathway. And so doing kinase assays in tumors, or in subsets of tumors, may be the, the route down the road. And I think there, there's certainly interest in doing that kind of research to really understand what the, the full profile of activity of the FGFR pathway is in, in the FGFR fusion setting or in other aberrations and to, to better understand the mechanism of response and that's something that my colleague John Gordon who might be stepped out right now is actually interested on, in working on in the lab so um, completely agree and definitely look to your your uh, the the lab to help answer exactly how these are working and you know again for the the purists doing a biomarker study would say one needs to test the agent and the, the marker positive. These are not binary necessarily markers, and they're much more complicated than a single gene, as you just more, said more eloquently than I could. But um, you know, a, a pure biomarker design in a, a lung cancer study where you have thousands of patients to work with would be biomarker positive, biomarker negative, test the agent, and then also have a control arm biomarker positive, biomarker negative, and, and really flesh out predictive prognostic and the mechanism that way, which we just don't have the patients to do. Patients and patients. <laughs> great. Well, thank you very much. That was great. And uh, big applause. Thank you. So uh, we're only 10 minutes behind. That's not bad for a whole day. But, uh, so we're going to make this break only for 20 minutes. When we come back, uh, we have a half an hour uh, form of a... Uh, collective debate. Uh, the first 10 minutes, we're going to have Dr. Lowry present on the second line biliary data, uh, and then followed by about 10 minutes uh, discussion among all physicians on uh, the uh, splitting versus lumping of the three diseases, and then another 10 minutes on immunotherapy. 
And uh, the idea is really just generate some thought for kind of like carry on uh, discussion for later on uh, uh, during our different interactions and meetings.